Old Soldiers Never Die, a Caiaphas Kane short story by Sandy Mitchell. This is an unofficial fan-made audio recording. Caiaphas Kane and Warhammer 40K are owned by Games Workshop, Black Library, and Sandy Mitchell. Please support the official release. Editorial note. Of all the desperate situations faced by Kane, when he had no alternative but to do so, the defense of Lentonia in 938.M41 must surely be counted one of the strangest, partly due to the nature of the foe, and partly due to the circumstances under which he found himself caught up in the events there. Editing this portion of his memoirs has been an equally atypical undertaking, since, for much of the events he describes, he was accompanied by an unusually reliable eyewitness, whose account I have used to supplement his own observations. I have also, in the interest of presenting as rounded a picture as possible, reluctantly incorporated a little additional material from the memoirs of Janet Sulla, which presents as formidable a challenge to the patience of the reader as those I've been forced to use hitherto, and for which I feel obliged to apologize in advance. As ever, I have left Kane's original account of events as close to how I found it as possible, keeping my own interpolations to a minimum, except for those I feel necessary to elucidate an obscure reference or otherwise clarify a potential ambiguity. Although, where Cain was concerned, ambiguity was often the most consistent thing about him. Amberly Vale, Ordo Zenos. Old Soldiers Never Die. 1. Given the number of times what was supposed to be a straightforward deployment turned out to be anything but, dropping me in the unit I was accompanying smack into the middle of a desperate struggle to survive, the knowledge that we'd arrived in the Lintonia system long after the war there had been brought to a victorious conclusion was a welcome change of pace. It wouldn't have done to let my natural inclination to do handsprings and shout huzzah show visibly, however, as I was popularly supposed to be the kind of idiot who'd relish the chance to put himself in harm's way in the name of the Golden Throne. So I settled on a vaguely rueful air, as though disappointed at our good fortune. Not that I was exactly relishing the prospect of the next few weeks, which promised little beyond unrelieved tedium and finger food, but compared to the kind of excitement I was used to, I'd take boredom over bowel-clinching terror every time. Especially as I'd only just made it up the boarding ramp of the last ship out at embarkation, the swarm of tyranids on our tail almost filling the horizon. I'm sure there are still a few pockets of resistance to mop up, I said, privately resolving to discover where they were and make sure I avoided them. Of course, Colonel Castine said running a finger around the collar of her dress uniform in the manner of someone suppressing the desire to unfasten it. Like most ice worlders, she preferred shirt sleeves for the most part, reserving the heavy greatcoats generally associated with Valhallen regiments for environments that they were fitted to, and had chosen summer kit for the occasion, although the weather in the planetary capital seemed distinctly autumnal, if you ask me. Dark gray clouds were scudding across a light gray sky mottled with flecks of blue, and the scent of recent rain had been the first thing to greet my nostrils as the boarding ramp of our shuttle extruded itself to lick the still damp rockcrete of the pad, as if tentatively quenching its thirst. In the distance, across the wide expanse of the landing field, columns of steam marked the points where the rest of our heavy shuttles had grounded. The commandeered freighter we'd arrived on didn't have nearly enough of its own to disembark an entire regiment, of course, but by this time the local traffic controllers had acquired sufficient experience of offloading large bodies of troops and their equipment to divert a veritable swarm of them to pick us up almost as soon as we'd reached orbit, and I'd made sure to be among the first ray to hit the ground, something I always tried to do when the likelihood of meeting significant resistance was low, as it consolidated my undeserved reputation for leading from the front, and gave me a head start for finding the most comfortable quarters where we were due to be billeted. I imagine the regiments already here will be happy to catch their breaths while we dot the I's and cross the T's. Who are they, anyway? Vostroyans, mostly, I said, glancing at the data slate my aide had just handed to me. Jurgen had tidied himself up, too, in so far as that was possible, centering his helmet on his head and brushing most of the accumulated detritus from the ragged clumps of facial hair which more or less assembled themselves into a scurf-flecked beard. Note. The typical Valhallen fur caps like the greatcoats Kane has already alluded to, generally being donned only in sub-zero temperatures. Despite these heroic efforts, he seemed to have stopped some way short of actual ablutions, however, and I found myself falling into my usual habit of edging up wind of him as I spoke. The three line regiments and an armor group, 
plus the Talon 236, who got here a couple of weeks ahead of the others, and after being diverted on their way back to Cronus for reassignment, and a Valhallen unit for fire support. I don't mind admitting my voice took on a tinge of surprise at this point. The 12th Field Artillery, the regiment I'd begun my long and inglorious career with some twenty years before. Haven't seen them since Gravelax, Castine said although whether she was pleased at the prospect of renewing the acquaintance or not was hard to tell, since she was fighting off another attempt at strangulation by her shirt-collar at this time. "'We've all come a long way since then,' I said, and the colonel nodded thoughtfully. "'Thanks to you,' she replied. "'If you hadn't joined us when you did, we wouldn't have lasted another week. Never mind seven years up at the sharp end.' Note. When Kane joined what was to become the 597th in 931.M41, the two former regiments making it up were practically at one another's throats. Typically, his account of that period of his career glosses over the credit that he undoubtedly deserves for welding them into an effective fighting unit, concentrating instead on what he perceives as his self-interested motives for doing so. Any other commissar would have done the same, I said, feeling unaccountably embarrassed for a moment, although I suppose many of my colleagues would have gone about the job in a rather more brutally straightforward fashion and probably ended up on the wrong end of a friendly fire accident, too, which is what tends to happen when you incur the displeasure of large number of people with guns. Castine looked as though she was about to take issue with that, but before she got the chance, Jürgen broke into the conversation with a phlegm-laden attempt at a tactful cough. <clears throat> I think that's your escort, sir. He sounded vaguely affronted at the notion, as if it somehow cast doubt on his own ability to ensure our safety. Although, since the wretched planet was supposed to be pacified by this point, the matter was purely one of protocol in any case. I think you're right, I agreed, as the small knot of vehicles drew closer. A ground car, too large, black, and shiny to be a military issue, was flanked by a couple of outriders on motorcycles, the pinnons flying from poles affixed to the riders' backs, echoing the design of the smaller ones fluttering around the limousine. I didn't recognize the heraldry, but it seemed to involve a great deal of gold thread entangling an imperial Aquila-like vines clambering up a wall. Look more like Arbites than soldiers. Note. Like many seasoned warp travelers, Kane tended to use the term Arbites colloquially to refer to local law enforcement, as well as to actual members of the Adeptus Arbites, which, given the bewildering variety of nomenclature on different worlds, he can hardly be blamed for. Where actual members of the Adeptus are present, however, he is usually punctilious about the distinction. Since he doesn't mention any arbitrators in the course of his narrative, it seems safe to assume that the handful one would normally expect to find on a populous imperial world were either too busy to socialize or had been killed in the fighting. "'Governor's household troops, sir,' Jürgen said, consulting the uniform guide in his data slate. "'Something I suppose I should have done myself before now. But in all fairness, I was familiar enough with those of the other guard regiments among our task force.' and the Lintonian militia were all either dead or confined to barracks, pending the purge of any who might have supported the wrong side in the recent insurrection. Anyone else in a uniform or carrying a gun would be fair game, or best avoided, depending on our relative numbers and firepower. I thought they'd shot him, I said. That was the old one, Castine said, a note of doubt entering her voice. Usually we had Major Brocklaw to fill us in on all these niggling little details, which he dutifully filleted from the brain-numbing morass of the Munitorum briefing materials, so the colonel and I didn't have to wade through them ourselves. But Brocklaw was still in orbit, waiting for the last shuttle down, to ensure our deployment went as smoothly as these things ever did. Note, and because the CO and second-in-command of an Imperial Guard regiment would never travel in the same shuttle, to ensure accident or enemy action would be unable to cripple it by thus simultaneous loss. I heard they found a nephew or something to take over. Good for them, I said, hoping he'd make a better fist of it than the last incumbent, who managed to rouse a placid and inferior-fearing population to armed rebellion with almost indecent haste following his appointment. Truth to tell, I was still somewhat vague about the exact nature of their grievances, but if the erstwhile governor ran true to form, it probably had something to do with treating the tithing revenues as his personal cash box, and taking an excessive interest in other people's wives, husbands, or farm animals. Note. Wives and husbands, if the rumors are true, but not the livestock. Probably. Probably.
All in all, Lentonia was probably better off without him, but letting the plebs get away with taking decisions like that for themselves would only lead to worse trouble later on. So, as usual, the guard had been called in to restore order, and visit retribution on whoever it seemed most expedient to blame. And, of course, the local chaos cults had all crawled out of the woodwork to join the fun. Although, if anything, they probably helped in the long run, providing a handy foe the Lentonians could feel good about uniting against, whatever their own differences. While we'd been mulling matters over, the car and its escort had pulled up at the foot of the boarding ramp, and the three of us walked down to meet it. The outriders saluted with simultaneous precision, the polarized visors of their helmets melding almost seamlessly with the glossy black body armor which encased them and I found myself suppressing a sudden flare of unease as I returned the gesture with my best parade ground snap. It was like acknowledging a couple of chunks of animate shadow. The slighter of the two, whose build led me to suspect the presence of a woman inside the protective carapace, although without sight of the face behind the blank reflective plate it was hard to be sure, dismounted, revealing a holstered hell pistol at her waist, no doubt meant to supplement the carbine stowed just forward of the saddle and whatever lethal surprises had been installed on the bike itself. She, for the sake of argument, took a step toward the car, reaching out a hand, but before she could open the passenger door for us, it popped from the inside, shoved hard by a young man with a shock of blonde hair and a wide, welcoming grin. "'It's all right, Clarice, I've got it,' he said, sliding across the wide seat to make room for us. The anonymous trooper turned away her body language making her affront to the breach of protocol perfectly plain in spite of her concealed visage. Sentiments I was certain Jurgen shared. The young man stuck out a hand as Jake. Jonas Warden, Planetary Governor. Call me Jonas. I've had a lifetime's worth of your excellency, Gash, in the last few weeks. Castine and I took in his worn grox-hide jacket and utility cloth trousers, and looked at one another dubiously. He didn't look like any of the Emperor's anointed I'd ever met. Caiaphas came, I said, concealing my bewilderment with the ease of a lifetime of practice, and taking the proffered hand, making sure not to exert the full strength of my augmentic fingers. No nickname, I'm afraid, but in my profession you tend not to make friends. Really? The young man looked faintly surprised, then grinned, as if realizing I was pulling his leg. There's a Valhallen officer calls you Kai. Sounds like a nickname to me. That would be Torin, I said, before glancing back at Castine who was being helped onto the overstumped bench seat by the same proffered hand. You remember Major Divas? No one else I could think of ever used the familiar form of my given name, which was just as well as I detested it, something Divas never quite managed to grasp, in spite of innumerable hints over the years. Of course, Castine said, while I settled into the seat opposite her and the young man, and wondered which of the polished wooden cabinets mounted on the wall concealed a decanter. A fine officer. She grinned at me, clearly enjoying my discomfiture. "'You don't look much like a governor,' I said, deciding to play the bluff man of action card. That usually went down well with civilians who thought they knew the sort of man I was, and I intended to use the technique a lot in the next few weeks. I still wasn't exactly overjoyed about being dragged into a political junket, and I was damned if I was going to be any more gracious about it than I had to be. "'I don't feel like one either,' Jonas said, with disarming candor, and I found myself in some danger of liking him. I used to glean news for the light of truth, till some dungwit dragged me off to the palace. Note. A well-regarded local print sheet. It can't have been that much of a surprise, I said. If you were next in line. Jonah laughed. Nowhere near it. My mother turned her back on the whole festering lot of them thirty years ago. Wouldn't have been here if she hadn't. I see, I said, although I didn't quite. There was still some bad feeling among the rest of the family, I take it? There surely is now, he grinned. Why do you think the Martial Law Council stuck me with the job? Out of guess, because you're the only member of the family who didn't want it, I said, and he nodded. They were fighting over the throne like rats in a sack. I did some good pieces on it. He started to pull out a battered data slate, then thought better of it, no doubt correctly divining that they wouldn't mean much to us anyway. Power broking, character assassination... A couple didn't stop at character, either. Sold a lot of sheets. Then he sighed, the animation which had come over him slipping away and waved a disgusted-looking hand at our luxurious surroundings. <sighs> now this. Your council's got a poor sense of humor. But a strong grasp of the practical, I thought. In my experience, the only people it's safe to have in a position of power are the ones who don't want to be there in the first place. 
Before I could say anything to that effect, however, my aide shadow filled the doorway, and his bouquet flowed out ahead of him to fill the car. Jonah recoiled. Jürgen, I said diplomatically, would you mind following us in the salamander? I'm sure is that our host has enough to do without seeing up to our quarters when the meeting's over. It's no trouble, the young man said, in the reflexively polite way of someone who knows you know they don't mean it, still too stunned at Jürgen's appearance to take umbrage at my very near use of the term he detested. As the door slammed, following Jürgen's, Very good, sir, and something resembling a salute, he shook himself as though rousing from a stupor. What was that? My aide, I said, feeling no further explanation to be warranted. Shouldn't we be going? I suppose so, Jonah said. Don't you want to wait for him to unload your transport? He'll catch up, Castine assured him, knowing Jürgen's robust attitude to anything with an engine, and clearly wondering how best to avoid the journey home. If you're sure. The governor tucks to box control. Back to the gas factory, Fossil. He must have caught the questioning look between Castine and myself, because he added, The concilium, for our benefit. Note. A colloquial contraction of Basilica Concilium, the meeting place of the governor's advisory council and de facto seat of government. The chauffeur, invisible behind a panel of one-way armor glass, rolled us smoothly into motion. Comfortable as the ride was, especially compared to being driven by Jürgen, and in spite of our host's attempts to while away the journey with polite conversation about my upcoming itinerary, I found it impossible to relax and enjoy our luxurious surroundings. Aside from the young man's eccentricity, meeting Imperial Guard officers from the starport in person hardly being the kind of thing planetary governors usually did, I was uncomfortably aware that his previous profession made him a shrewd judge of people, and more likely than most to see through the facade I generally presented to the galaxy. In addition to which, I'd been in enough vehicles like this to be well aware of what a tempting target they made. There were still malcontents on the loose, by Jonah's own admission, and even if they had no idea of who was inside the sh big shiny car, it was clearly someone of wealth and influence. Protecting it with no more than a pair of outriders was tantamount to towing a sign saying, Assassinate me! So far as I could see. In fact, I'd been the target of just such an attempt myself on Pereira Munda. Although, to be fair, on that occasion I'd been the unfortunate victim of a case of mistaken identity. Note. The real target being the local arbitrator, who'd sent his car for Kane as a courtesy. Accordingly, I paid a fair amount of attention to our surroundings as we left the bleak expanse of the starport and began to make our way into the city proper. Like many predominantly urban worlds, the main conurbation was contiguous with the boundary of the landing field, the outer hab blocks protected by the consequences of a crash, or explosion, by a thick, high blast wall, through which we trundled in a short, squat tunnel. Not unnaturally, this made a formidable fortification, which the rebels had attempted to hold against the arriving Imperial forces, resulting in a fair amount of damage, particularly once my old comrades from the 12th Field Artillery unlimbered their earth shakers and got stuck in. Deep craters in the inner walls and a few crumbling ramparts clearly marked the positions where the main fortifications had been. Shells being shells, the hab blocks around the perimeters had taken quite a battering, too, and on first re-emerging into daylight, we found ourselves traversing a bleak hinterland of tumbled walls and scattered rubble, through which the hastily patched roadway slashed like a gutting knife. At first I thought it deserted, but before long occasional glimpses of a stretched tarp or smoke from a cooking fire betrayed the presence of inhabitants, eking out what existence they could among the ruins. Outliers, Jonah said, seeing the direction of my gaze. Not much trouble unless they get caught up in a food riot. Most of them just want to be left alone. Most of them, I said, my paranoia going into overdrive, and the governor shrugged. There's a few rock lobbers among them, and the gangers squabbling over territory, but they'll keep till the local militia are reactivated. Glad to hear it, I said, somewhat relieved, but still keeping my hands near my weapons. I was beginning to see movement between the shattered walls, more and more frequently and wondered if waiting for the rest of the regiment might not have been a better idea. "'Why are we slowing?' Castine asked, unfastening the flap of her holster, and I hastened to follow her lead. We'd both spent most of our lives in war zones and knew from bitter experience that even the most subtle intimations of trouble should never be ignored. Jonah looked bewildered and about as nervous as most civilians do when their guests unexpectedly draw sidearms in a confined space. My chainsword I left scabbarded for the nonce, as it would be more of a danger to ourselves and our sudden claustrophobic surroundings than to a putative attacker. No idea, he said, 
and activated the Vox. Fossil? The road's blocked, the chauffeur informed us, sounding irritated rather than concerned. Some kind of crowd up ahead. Armed? I asked. Nothing obvious, a feminine voice cut in. Clarice, I presumed. They're just milling around. Trading food, probably. Moving up to clear them. Can we see from in here? Castine asked, a moment before I could pose the question myself, and the governor poked a control stud. With a squeal of gears, the partition retracted, revealing our driver, dressed in the same body armor as the outriders, but without a helmet. Beyond him, the road was now visible, blocked by twenty or thirty ragged-looking civilians. It was hard to make much out, as the shadows were plentiful and deep, but they were an unhealthy-looking bunch, their skin sallow, their movements slow and uncoordinated. All of a sudden, I found myself grateful for the armored bodywork surrounding us, for I had no doubt that it would be proof against any weapons this curiously passive mob might bring to bear. Not a single one reacted as the motorcyclists bore down on their position, beyond slowly turning heads to track their movement. The outriders drew to a halt a few meters away, their engines revving, and ordered them to disperse. Still no reaction, and I found my palms tingling, a warning from my subconscious I'd learned to take seriously over the years. Pull back! I cautioned, hoping the Vox would relay my words. But if they did, it was too late. The whole crowd suddenly began to move, like a single viscid pool of degenerate humanity, surging forward to engulf the riders before either could react. Both troopers tried to gun their engines and pull away, but hadn't room to turn the heavy bikes. As we watched, helpless and horrified, they were pulled from their mounts and overwhelmed by sheer force of numbers, disappearing into the depths of the mob as thoroughly as if they'd been absorbed by a tyrannid swarm. What he said! Jonah snapped, knowing trouble when he saw it, which was hardly surprising given his former occupation. Unfortunately, the chauffeur had kept us moving slowly forward, confident in his comrade's ability to clear the way, and by the time he slammed the gears into reverse, with a grinding sound even Jürgen might have winced at, the tide of bodies was already lapping around our fragile refuge. The car bumped, running over several yielding obstacles, before suddenly fetching up against an immovable one with a groan of stressed metal. Unable to see... Our driver had mounted the pavement and rammed into one of the larger pieces of rubble. "'How solid is this thing?' I asked, flipping the safety off my last pistol, while Castine chambered around into her bolt pistol, and began an urgent conversation about reinforcements over her box speed. Reinforcements we both knew were unlikely to arrive in time. "'Solid enough,' Jonah said, although I doubted that. The colonel's bolt pistol could definitely punch a hole through an armor glass window, although doing so from this side would undoubtedly deafen us not to mention fill the passenger compartment with rager edge shards. Our attackers didn't seem to be carrying any arbor-piercing small rounds, however, so getting in would take them a little more time than that. Or not. Blank-eyed, heedless of the damage they were doing to themselves, they kept battering relentlessly at the bodywork, clawing at the metal and armor glass in their single-minded determination to get in. The window nearest my head crazed where one of the riders butted it repeatedly, flecks of blood and brain tissue marring the transparent surface. Most disturbing of all was the silence. Throughout their frenzied onslaught, not one of them spoke. Although given their behavior, that was hardly surprising. I'd seen things in Jürgen's hair that showed more signs of intelligence. Even the sounds of their movement were inaudible, muffled by the thick armor enclosing us. They're insane, Castine said, more of a dispassionate tactical assessment than an expression of alarm, despite her vehemence. Nor on combat drugs, I agreed, although where they might have got them from was beyond me. I turned to the governor, who was looking pale and hyperventilating. A bad sign, as, offhand, I could hardly think of worse circumstances in which to be stuck in a confined space with a panicking civilian. Any of the local gangers use slot, zerk, stuff like that? No, I, I don't think so. As I'd hoped, answering the simple, direct question brought him back a little, and I pressed my advantage. You're a gleaner, right? Anything unusual, you'd know. He shook his head, though whether in negation or to clear it would be anybody's guess. The last year or so, they've been nothing but wild stories, he told me. The insurrection, then the heretics. There were even supposed to be psychers among them, but nobody actually saw any. The whole car lurched, a development I didn't like the feel of in the least. They're climbing onto the roof, Castine said, clearly wondering whether to try putting a bolt through it to discourage them, before deciding against the experiment, much to my relief. The top armor would be the weakest, to save weight but it might still be strong enough to direct the full force of the explosive charge back towards us. The floor, on the other hand, had been heavily reinforced against mines, lowering the car's center of gravity, and thank the throne for that. They'd probably have had us over by now if it wasn't. Sure enough, the battering sound above us grew louder, 
and the ceiling began to develop some ominous dents. Isolated from us in his armor glass box, the chauffeur produced a combat shotgun from under his seat and racked it with an ominous clack, clearly anticipating the end in a matter of moments. I was just on the point of committing my spirit to the Emperor, and hoping he hadn't been paying too much attention to my activities of late, when the world around us erupted in a flickering orange glare. Searing flames lapped against the immobilized car, our attackers crisping and withering, losing the grips on the bodywork along with their musculature. Naked bones appeared through the sizzling flesh, skulls leering at us for a moment before falling away. Then the firestorm ceased as abruptly as it had begun. "'You all right, sir?' Jurgen asked his familiar and welcome voice suddenly filling my vox speed, as he brought the hurtling salamander to a shuddering halt amid a blizzard of shredded roadbed from beneath the locked tracks. He waved a cheerful greeting over the jagged lip of metal where a carnifax had ripped the top of the driver's compartment clean away in its eagerness to get at him during our desperate flight to safety. Unsurprisingly, it seemed, the regimental engine seers were still concentrating their efforts on getting the chimeras back into shape, my personal transport having to wait its turn in the name of operational efficiency. Fine! I kicked the car door open and piled out instantly, drawing my chainsaw as I meant. There were still scattered pools of blazing promethium from the heavy flame burst in our immediate vicinity, not to mention a fair number of combusting corpses, and after our fuel tank had been ruptured, the whole thing could go up at any moment. Nothing attacked me, although if any of our assailants still lived and were making a run for it, I couldn't tell. The thick pole of foul-smelling smoke from their fellow's immolation concealing most of our surroundings from view. Now that I had break... Now that it seemed I'd escaped sharing their fate, I had an image to maintain. So I glanced back at Castine, Jonah, and the open-mouthed chauffeur with an appropriately heroic flourish of my weapons, and beckoned to them. All clear, I said, rather spoiling the gesture with a cough, as I got a lungful of greasy smoke. Lucky the armor held, Castine said, with a rather tight nod in Jurgen's direction. Thought it would, my aide agreed phlegmatically. But it wouldn't have if I'd used the heavy bolter to scrape them off. I suppose not, I agreed, unable to fault his logic, and scabbering the chainsword again, I turned to the governor. It seems it's my turn to offer you a lift. I appreciate it, the young man assured me, scrambling into the rear passenger compartment of the salamander, while his chauffeur stood guard with the shotgun, glancing left and right in barely suppressed panic. Best check on the outriders, Castine said, leading the way towards the wreckage of the motorbikes. Conscious of our audience, I began to follow her despite the almost overwhelming impulse to clamber aboard the scout vehicle and get as far away from this blighted wasteland as possible. As I approached the nearest body, Jurgen joined me, his last gun held ready for use, and his distinctive odor fighting to be noticed over the stench of the crackling cadavers. Messy, he commented, looking down, and I nodded. The larger of the two outriders had been partially protected from the fury of the mob by his body armor, but clearly not thoroughly enough. His head was lolling at an angle only possible with a broken neck while several plates of his external carabus had been ripped clean away, exposing the flesh beneath, and the condition of that had already been accurately summarized by my aide. After some of the sights I've seen, it takes a lot to turn my stomach, but those raking, bone-exposing wounds did the trick all right, not least because I had no doubt that I'd have suffered a similar fate if my aide hadn't intervened in so timely a fashion. Are those bite marks? I asked. Incredulous, although the answer to that was obvious after even the most cursory inspection, the manner in which the flesh was torn all too distinctive. Jurgen nodded. Looks like, he agreed, as incapable as ever of recognizing a rhetorical question. This one's alive, Castine called, forestalling any further comment I might have made, and we hurried over to join her. Clarice had fared a little better, evidently having had time to draw her hell pestle and get off a shot or two before being borne to the ground. Although she was unconscious, and her visible wounds were hardly less severe than those of her deceased colleague. Not for long, I said, while Jurgen produced a medipack from the collection of pouches and webbings he was habitually festooned with, and began patching up the worst of the leaks. Unless we get her to a medic, eh? Castine nodded, her face set. We will, she said grimly. Then I'm sending in a couple of platoons to clear the ruins. She shook her head, still unwilling to believe the evidence of her own eyes. Cannibals in the heart of an imperial capital. It's intolerable. Desperation can drive people to almost anything, I said. Although if the tingling in my palms was anything to go by, that was something a lot deeper and darker at the heart of Lintonia than that. Just how dark, though, I had still to discover. 2. What with one thing and another, our official reception at the Concilium was rather late in starting, 
Like most of the local seats of government, the huge building was vulgarly over-ornamented on the outside, so the local plebeians would be left in no doubt of the exalted state of their rulers and betters, and even more so on the inside, to produce an appropriate sense of awe among those venturing within to petition the administrative functionaries who thronged the place, or paid their tithes. The effect on Castine and I was rather the opposite, however, since we'd seen it all before, and tended to notice things like the way the guilt was tarnishing on the death masks of deceased local luminaries, Jonah's immediate predecessors being a notable absentee, and the inordinate number of fraying threads in the fading tapestries of long-forgotten triumphs. If Jurgen had an opinion, he kept it to himself, merely parting the throng of battling pick recorders and print scribes between us and the door with grim determination, the butt of his last gun, and a bow wave of halitosis. Over a hundred heads turned in our direction as we entered the high, wide reception room, which, to my complete lack of surprise, resembled nothing so much as a gambling den with pretensions to an air of sophistication. Spotting a refreshment table, I made my way toward it as best I could through the scrum, most of the components of which seemed to want a word or handshake. Reminding myself that this was what I was here for, and clearing the way with my chainsword was probably a bad idea, I smiled and nodded like an automaton pretending to remember names and faces, none of which made an impression strong enough to last a second beyond the breaking of eye contact. When I finally made it to the viands, I found I might as well not have bothered. It seemed Yona hadn't been exaggerating about the extent of the food shortages he'd mentioned in the course of our journey here. If the top of the social heap were making do with such basic fare, Throne alone knew what the commoners were eating, apart from each other. All of a sudden, the evidence of cannibalism I'd stumbled across seemed a lot less surprising although the thought of it still stirred my stomach. The meager table had one compensation for the effort required to reach it, however. A steaming samovar stood at one end, exuding the welcome odor of tanna and a faint hiss of steam, no doubt intending to make the Valhallen contingent feel at home. Following my nose through the obstacle course of scarlet Vostroyan uniforms, admixed with flowing Talon robes, and the rather more ornate garments favored by local officials and nobles, I pitched up to the urn, while the governor did his best to make himself heard over the babble of conversation. "'Sorry we're late,' he said, his voice shaking a little. He still looked a bit green around the gills to me, although whether this was the result of delayed shock or his first exposure to Jurgen's driving, I couldn't be sure. "'We were attacked!' He went on for some while after that, giving the impression that I'd leapt out of the car to face the mob and seen them off single-handed, while I turned my attention to the Tana. "'Kai!' a familiar voice called. A hand fell on my arm, and I turned, selecting an appropriate expression of pleased surprise. Torin! Sure enough, it was Devis, a tana bowl of his own in one hand, grinning at me in the puppyish manner I remembered so well. I was wondering if you'd be here. Rather to my own surprise, I found I wasn't having to work nearly as hard at looking pleased as I'd expected. The intervening years had evidently been kind to him. The streaks of gray around his temples hadn't spread very far and the lines on his face were still faint enough to be barely noticeable. "'I knew you'd be joining us eventually,' he grinned, "'once you got bored with charging off to chase heretics, as usual. "'Which was one of the reasons I tolerated his company. "'Despite being better placed than most to see past the facade "'I took such pains to present to the galaxy, "'he believed implicitly in my heroic public persona. "'Perhaps because he chafed at the lack of opportunities afforded to him "'to engage the enemy directly in an artillery regiment,' which generally potted them from a safe distance of several kilometers, and being even tangentially associated with my exploits allowed him a little vicarious excitement. A note, the very reason Cain had had for contriving his assignment to them at the beginning of his career. Little enough compared to what you and the other regiments have been through, I said. So far as I could see, the senior officers of all the Imperial Guard regiments on the planet were assembled in the room, along with their commissars, the high command of the local militia, and the usual random assortment of local notables. Most of them looked haggard and gaunt, on the brink of exhaustion, which was hardly surprising. The fighting had been concentrated around Vyasalix, since whoever controlled the capital effectively controlled the world, and city fighting against an enemy who knows the terrain is grim, attritional business. I had no doubt they'd be heartily glad to hand the mopping up over to the 597th, and take the chance of a bit of downtime before moving on to their next war. Castine was conversing with Colonel Mostru, the CO of the 12th Field Artillery, who didn't seem to have changed a bit. Seeing me glance in their direction, he nodded a curt greeting, before resuming what looked like an urgent discussion with her. 
no doubt filling her in on all the stuff that had been left out of our briefing slate. We've taken a battering, all right, Divas admitted soberly. A couple of the Vestroyan regiments are almost down to half strength, and the Twelfth is pretty stretched as well. Nothing like as bad as that yet, of course, but still, he shrugged. Has the fighting really been that fierce? I asked, trying to remember how much combat damage we'd passed coming in. A fair bit, of course, but all around obvious strategic targets, and no sign of the widespread collateral devastation I'd expected to see if the guard had been taking anything like that much of a battering. Devis shook his head. Some kind of local lurgy, he said. It hit the militia first, then started running through the guard. He looked as though he was about to say more. But before he could, Jonah drew everyone's attention back to me with a wave of his hand. Anyway, we got here, he concluded, his breath and color restored by a large mug of recap and a sticky-looking pastry, the last traces of which he licked from his fingers before continuing. Thanks to Commissar Kane, at which point every face in the room turned in my direction. I'm afraid the governor exaggerates, I said, thereby consolidating the story nicely with my audience with the possible accession of Mastru, who'd never quite taken my reputation at face value, and had spent most of my time with his regiment trying to nudge me into harm's way to test it for himself. But at least I can hold my head up in this company now, having seen a little action on Lentonia. I was rewarded, as I'd hoped, with a ripple of polite laughter. You're all to be commended for your efforts, I said, feeling that if I'd been brought here to give them a pat on the back and make everyone feel appreciated, I might as well make a start on the job as soon as possible. Not to mention reassure the population that Lintonia was once again safely within the fold of the Imperium. So anyone harboring heretical sympathies had better think twice about it. I filled the bowl with Tana and delivered it to Castine, thus bringing myself back into the governor's orbit, along with that of most of the other Imperial Guard officers, who seemed even more keen to make her acquaintance than mine. Which I could hardly blame them for, attractive women in the Imperial Guard being something of a rarity. Doran was just telling me about this mystery bug, I said. I take it that's the real reason the militia are still confined to barracks? It is, Yona said. If we deploy them to keep the peace before we're sure who or who isn't infected, it could get a foothold among the civilian population. Buy a weapon? Castine asked, an instant before I could. A malady which seemed to strike down soldiers while leaving most of the civilians untouched seemed a suspicious coincidence to me, too. The colonel of one of the Vestroyan regiments shook his head, his extravagant mustache bristling. First thing we thought of. But deploying something like that's way beyond the insurgents' capabilities. Unless it was one of the Chaos cults, I suggested. Are any of them still acted? Completely cleansed, the colonel of the Talarn regiments assured me, before adding, we would certainly have spotted the signs if they weren't. I'm sure you would, I agreed. Talarns are among the most devout followers of the Emperor in the galaxy, and if anyone could be counted on to detect traces of heresy, it would have been them. So, an unfortunate coincidence, I said, although my innate paranoia was still having a hard time accepting that, and kept worrying away at the matter despite my best efforts to get it to sit down and shut up, which, I'm bound to say, failed. And given how bad things were to work out in the end, that was probably no bad thing. Editorial Note at this point, one of the elisions typical of Kane's accounts of events occur, picking up the narrative again after a period of several days. The following extract may go some way towards remedying this deficiency. From The Liberation of Lintonia by Jonas Warden, Uncompleted Manuscript Despite his obvious reluctance to be separated from his regiment, Commissar Kane followed the path of duty, as I had no doubt he would once I got the measure of the man. I had harbored doubts before our first meeting, knowing how reputations can become exaggerated, but those had been laid to rest the moment I saw him bound from our immobilized car, resolutely determined to defend us from any further attacks without hesitation or thought for his own safety. Accordingly, though it clearly chafed him to be feted in public, and fritterer a time he would have preferred to spend bringing the Emperor's justice to those determined to prolong the conflict, he devoted himself to the ceremonial duties we concocted as doggedly as he would have done those on the battlefield. The stratagem was undeniably successful, although the situation it was intended to divert attention from went from bad to worse. Despite the best efforts of both Medicaid and Magos biologists, no effective treatment was found for the virus, which had struck down so many gallant warriors was found. 
the victims remaining either comatose or violently delirious depending on their level of sedation. Worse still, in spite of the rigorous quarantine to which all confirmed victims had been subjected, fresh cases kept occurring. A week after their arrival, only the Valhallen 597th remained free of the disease, and no one expected this happy state of affairs to remain for much longer. 3. Let's hope that's not a glimpse into our own future, Castine murmured to me, with a jaundiced look at the row of coffins facing us in the chancel of the cathedral. I've never been one for Ember bothering myself, but I'd been dragged into enough places of worship in the course of my duties to appreciate the ornate grandeur of this particular one. The soaring arches of the nave meeting high above us, obscured by shadows and the rising clouds of incense, while icons of the emperor and his blessed saints cluttered up every available surface. There were twelve of the polished wooden caskets in all, containing the mortal remains of an officer and a line trooper randomly selected from the casualties of each of the six regiments which had put down the rebellion, to be commended to the golden throne with all possible ceremony in symbolic appreciation of the sacrifice of all the fallen. The throne alone knew what had happened to the rest, although I strongly suspected that they had been interred with more regard for speed than for the niceties. "'Any illness in the 597th yet?' I asked, fidgeting on the ironwood pew, which was getting hideously uncomfortable already, and readjusting the scabbard of my chainsaw for about the thousandth time, in a foredoomed effort to find a place where it wouldn't dig into the tenderest part of my thigh. The ecclesiarchy had been predictably sniffy about the number of sidearms the congregation had brought in with them, but as they were as much a part of the dress uniform as the braid and the hat plumes, they just had to lump it. To my relief, the colonel shook her head. I'd spent the last couple of weeks ricocheting around Lintonia, shaking hands, inspecting troops, opening buildings, and, for a breathtakingly tedious couple of afternoons, posing for a portrait, which mainly seemed to involve waving a floor mop around. The artist had assured me that it would be miraculously transformed into an imperial standard by the time he'd finished slopping paint on the canvas, and I pretended to believe him. This was the first opportunity I'd had to talk to Castine in person, and since neither of us was particularly comfortable discussing sensitive matters over the Vox, assess how matters stood in the planetary capital. No telling how long that's likely to last, though, she replied, clearly expecting the worst. Did you clear the camps around a landing field? I inquired, hoping to move the conversation on to less depressing matters, and Castine shrugged. Swept the ruins, but it was hardly worth the effort. Whoever was living there had already packed up and left. Or got eaten, I suggested, and Castine frowned. There was enough blood and bone around, she agreed, not quite managing to hide her revulsion. But they'll be brought to account. No cornate shrines, I suppose, I said, still unable to credit that imperial citizens could fall so far without a little nudge from the ruinous powers, and the colonel shook her head. If there had been, we'd have burned the place out, she assured me, and I nodded. I'd have expected nothing less. At which point the choir struck up the processional, accompanied by appropriately solemn music, and I stood gratefully, while what seemed like half the senior ecclesiarchs on the planet filed in. Note. Not quite that many, though several were certainly present. Enveloped in richly embroidered ceremonial robes. Behind them came the local notables, led by Jonah, although I'd failed to recognize him for the first few minutes, as he'd been smothered for the occasion in enough over-ornamented fabric to weigh down an augurin. Spotting me at about the same time as the coin dropped, he favored me with a rueful grin, clearly uncomfortable, but determined to see his duty through. By this time, the most absurdly overdressed of the emperor botherers had broken free of the pack, leaving the secular contingent to seat themselves in the front row of the pews, while the remaining ecclesiarchs ranged themselves about the chancel according to their status and degree of involvement in the ritual. Once everybody else had settled, the presiding cleric favored us with a self-satisfied benediction, and began to pontificate about the nobility of sacrifice, with all the pompous sincerity of someone for whom that meant being a little late for dinner, rather than dying an agonizing death on a far distant world, in the hope that it might somehow make an incremental difference in the fight to throw back the tide of darkness, poised to roll over us all. "'I now call upon Commissar Kane to say a few words,' the prelate finished, having apparently exhausted his own supply at last, and I rose to my feet, conscious of the anticipatory murmur which rustled around the cavernous space. My feet echoed on the flagstones as I strolled forward, trying to look both solemn and unhurried, feeling the pressure of two hundred pairs of eyes on the back of my neck as I did so. Not just them, either. A small constellation of servo-skulls was floating around the vaulting, 
carrying pictures and contended to record my words for posterity. Note, and everyone else's. Contrary to Kane's usual opinion, not everything was about him. Thank you, Hierophant. I hesitated a moment, before continuing in response to Castine's silently mouthed prompter. Callister, we who defend the Imperium with our lives, our blood, and our very souls are fully aware of the destination to which the path of duty so often leads. I broke off again, as a muffled scratching sound tickled my ear. It was barely perceptible, but it raised the hairs on the back of my neck even so. Over the years I'd learned to distrust anything that sounded like stealthy movement, particularly if I was unable to get a line of sight on whatever might be causing it, and I had to consciously suppress the urge to reach for my weapons. I took a deep breath, hoping the unintended dramatic pause might be mistaken for a rhetorical flourish. Not that it mattered anyway, the picked recordings would be edited before being disseminated to the local population, so I'd end up looking like a silver-tongued orator, whatever happened. So thinking, I launched myself back into the, my prepared speech, minor variations of which had served me well at far too many similar depressing ceremonies over the years, only to falter yet again. This time a loud thud echoed around the cathedral, and a ripple of puzzled expressions spread among the pews, turning rapidly to unease as the sound was repeated. Castine unflastened the flap of her holster, an example followed by many of the officers from the other regiments here to speed their comrades to the Golden Throne and I found the urge to do likewise impossible to resist. Commissar, the pudgy prelate expostulated in horror, as I loosened my chainsword in its scabbard. This is a house of the emperor. Then I'm sure it approve of us keeping it safe, I reposted, in no mood to debate the matter. The scrabbling sound had grown louder, to the point where I could no longer persuade myself that it was merely harmless vermin in the heating ducts. By now the front few rows of the congregation were tilting their heads, plainly trying to pinpoint their source. The thudding had increased, too, in both volume and intensity, multiple blows overlapping one another in a steady roll on drums, like a panicky heartbeat. Whatever the cause, it was clearly time to be somewhere else, although I could hardly cut and run in front of so many witnesses. Then inspiration struck. Regina! Note. Castine's given name. I called above the hubbub. Get the governor to safety! Everyone out! Castine called, picking up her cue perfectly, and drawing her bolt pistol to emphasize the point. Make for the doors in an orderly fashion. Which, of course, civilians being civilians, might just as well have been mill around like panic-stricken sheep. Nevertheless, she and the other guard officers managed to start herding the local dignitaries towards the exit, which was fine by me. True, the press of bodies in the aisle was effectively blocking me from making a run for it myself, but I'd been in enough places like this to be certain that the clergy had their own entrances and exits. The back way, I said, turning to Callister. Now the governor's safe, I need to get you. What's going on? Jonah asked, materializing at my elbow, shrugging his encumbering vestments to the floor with every sign of relief. Beneath him, he was wearing a shirt with frayed cuffs and a pair of artisan's trousers covered with pockets. Are we in any danger? Before I could compose an adequate response to that, which didn't include the phrase half-wit, cretin, or death wish, I was interrupted by the sound of splintering wood, and whirled to face the serried coffins behind us. The noise was unquestionably coming from that direction, and for a moment I found myself wondering what kind of vermin or parasite could have found its way into the tightly sealed boxes to gorge itself on the cadavers within. But the reality was worse than anything I could possibly have imagined. With a further rending of wood, a guard-issued combat boot smashed its way into view through the end of the nearest casket. Seeing it, Choristers around us promptly panicked and fled, with surprisingly melodious shrieks of primal terror. "'It's a miracle!' Callister genuinely reflected towards the image of him on earth, and took a faltering step toward the flailing limb. "'We have to help them!' "'That's not a miracle,' I said, dragging him back by the arm. The Hierophant knew the way out of here, and I wasn't going to let him get himself killed before he showed me how to find it. "'Quite the reverse!' "'Warcraft?' Jonah asked sounding intrigued rather than frightened, and I shrugged in as nonchalant a manner as I could, thumbing the selector of the chainsword to maximum speed. Jurgen's presence would have answered that question quickly enough, but the mere thought of his image being pick-cast of the world alongside mine at so solemn a ceremony had been enough to persuade me to leave him back at the garrison. A decision I rude heartily now, as his peculiar talent for nullifying any warp-spawn influences in his immediate vicinity had saved my skin on more than one occasion.' 
Probably, I said, hoping I'd be able to deal with the situation without my aide's help for once. I tried to sound as if I knew what I was talking about. But this is consecrated ground, so it'll be weak if it is. At which point the prelate looked happier, even if nobody else did. I flinched as the crackling of breaking wood redoubled in volume, and the abused coffin started to fall in on itself. The others were beginning to look distinctly fragile, too. I began hustling the dignitaries away, as best I could with a weapon in each hand. Now we need to get you out. He nodded and turned to go, common sense finally overriding his old professional instinct to poke his nose into things, just as the nearest corpse flung the battered remains of its coffin aside and rolled from the beer supporting it, landing on the cold stone floor with a slap like a pistol shot. It lay still for a moment, incongruously clad in a neatly creased dress uniform, then thrashed its arms and legs as if trying to work out how to stand. I put a las bolt in its chest as it clambered upright, but it rolled slowly to its feet anyway, apparently unperturbed. Keep back, I cautioned, with every intention of heeding my own advice, and got my first good look at the thing we were facing. It was unquestionably the cadaver of one of the Vestroyan soldiery, the extravagant mustaches cultivated by the guardsmen from that world standing out even more fully than usual against the withered flesh and sunken skin of its decomposing face. Note. So distinctive a fashion that they almost constitute part of their uniform. Indeed, it has been suggested, not entirely facetiously, that the size and degree of grooming are at least as reliable signifier of status as the official insignia of rank. Its eyes were blank, rolled so far into the orbits that they showed little other than the white, but the animated corpse seemed aware of our presence nonetheless. It raised a twisted hand, the nails of which seemed to have elongated into talons by the decay of the fleshy fingertips behind them, and shambled forward. I fired the last pistol again, with no more effect than the last time. Stay dead, damn it! I snarled, although whether that was the terror manifesting his anger or desperate entreaty, I have no idea. Jonah seemed to take it for the former, however, aiming a tight smile in my direction in spite of the fresh ambulatory carcasses bursting out of their wooden chrysalides on all sides of us. "'Remind you of anything?' he asked sardonically, backing away as he spoke. Now that he came to mention it, it did. The way the animate cadavers moved, with grim fixity of purpose, their expressions blank, was uncannily reminiscent of the mob which had attacked us on the way in from the starport. The main difference was the sound, which I presume the bodywork of the car had insulated us from before. This time I could hear it, a low, muffled groaning emanating from all of them, as though they'd just woken to the kind of hangover where even your eyelashes ache. For all I know, they had. Note. More likely it was simply air or the gases of decomposition passing over the vocal cords. At any rate, it got on my nerves, and I fired a third time, taking the nearest revenant in the throat. This time the shot did have an effect, as it staggered, then began to move in short, random jerks, bumping into his fellows in the beers as it did so. Encouraged, I put a second las bolt in the same spot, this time succeeding in spevering the spinal column which the first had exposed through the ruin of the revenant's neck. It dropped like a puppet with severed strings, a disquieting thought because I'd rather beg the question of who was pulling them. Will you stop fracking around and just run? I demanded, as the whole shambling mob began to close in on us. Which was easier said than done, as the aisle was clogged with panicking local dignitaries. Among them I caught a glimpse of Castine, grimly fording her way toward us against the current, but unable to use her bolt pistol for fear of hitting an innocent bystander. "'Avant!' Callister cried, having a sudden and inconvenient rush of courage or misplaced piety to the head. He'd taken the golden aquila from around his neck and was brandishing it in the general direction of the shuffling horrors banding down on us. "'In the name of the Emperor, be gone!' Then the closest of them made a sudden snatch, which would surely have seized his arm and dragged him into the reach of its charnel reeking jaws, if its grotesquely elongated nails hadn't snagged in the trailing sleeve of his chucible. Exquisite embroidery tore as the talons ripped through it, and the hierophant leaped backwards with a squeak of alarm, bringing down his crozius on the crown of the assailant's head as he did so. The heavy gold icon of him on earth crushed the revenant's skull, and it slumped to its knees, foul-smelling fluid seeping from its eyes and nose. "'Well done, your grace,' I called encouragingly, hoping that he'd finally come to his senses after a squeak that narrow." and he nodded, looking both surprised and pleased with himself. Now move your arse! I'd like to claim that my choice of phrase was a deliberate ploy, hoping to shock him into acquiescence by the sudden descent into profanity in these hallowed precincts. But if I'm honest, I was simply too annoyed to care. <laughs>
There were still too many witnesses around for me to simply cut and run, however much I might wish to, and the longer these idiots insisted on lingering, the longer I'd be in imminent danger. Fortunately, he listened this time and scuttled back in my direction, which, with Jonah now getting mired in the rush for the main door, left me in the uncomfortable position of being closest to the revenants. Unwilling to turn my back on them, in case they rushed me as soon as they saw an opening, note, highly unlikely, as revenants generally act purely on instinct. I backed away slowly, keeping my chainsword raised in guard position, which, though I had no idea of the fact at the time, looked as though I was covering the Hierophant's retreat, and did my fraudulent reputation no end of good. The one the prelate had poleaxed was on the floor now, still twitching, but in short, spasmodic movements, while the rest of the pack shuffled around it, spreading out slowly like a patch of oil on the surface of a pond. Which was a worrying development. Already the ones on the edge of the group were approaching the limits of my peripheral vision, and I found myself worrying about being flanked as soon as I couldn't keep all of them in sight at once. I needn't have worried too much on that score, though, as the revenants seemed to be wary of me, or perhaps the weapons I carried. None had sufficient intellect left to seek cover, dropping below the level of the pews as I would have done, but they didn't seem discouraged either, just moving forward at a steady walking pace toward the gradually diminishing knot of struggling dignitaries jammed in the doorway. I put a couple more las bolts into the nearest, trying for headshots as these seemed the most effective, but succeeded only in blowing away part of its face and jaw before an inconvenient pillar hid it from view. Caiaphas! Castine shouted, breaking free of this drum at last. Look down! I did as she bade and recoiled in horror. The revenant the hierophant had felled was crawling towards me, leading a clotted trail of noisome fluid as it came, an outstretched hand on the point of seizing my ankle. I struck down with the chainsword, severing the limb at the elbow, but the animate cadaver didn't even slow down, continuing to advance as inexorably as a necron. I hacked at it again and again, carving it into foul-smelling chunks, but it only stopped moving once I severed the spinal column. Go for headshots, I called to the colonel, alarmed to see that while I'd been unoccupied, the undead guardsmen had dispersed even more widely. Of the hierophant, there was no sign at all, which was encouraging in a way, as I'd be able to take the credit for saving his neck. But disconcerting, too, as I'd hoped to see where he went and follow him as quickly as possible. No need, Castine said, a trifle smugly, and thiled her bolt pistol at one of the revenants closing in on Jonah. Its rib cage blew apart as the explosive tip bolt detonated decorating the intricate wood carving on the end of the nearest pew with half-rotted entrails. I took a shot at the other, which hit, but proved as ineffectual as ever, the last bolt simply gouging a chunk out of the obscene thing's right shoulder. Undeterred, it reached out for Jonah with its left. Warned by the slightly soggy explosion of Castine's bolt, Jonah looked up in alarm and ducked out of the way in the nick of time. Unfortunately, that left him between two pews, backing up as the modile cadaver plotted relentlessly after him. Even more unfortunately, one of the pillars supporting the ceiling was at the end of the gap, instead of an exit to the nearest aisle, a fact the young governor only became aware of when he backed into the immovable obstruction. The brief flurry of activity had given another knot of undead troopers enough time to shamble uncomfortably close to me, so I turned and hurried up the nave, having little inclination to try my blade against the three of them at once. It would only take a single misstep or mistimed blow for one of them to get under my guard, and once that happened the weight of numbers would be certain to tell. The one on the left was wearing a Valhallen artilleryman's uniform, and I glanced at what was left of its face as I retreated with a faint sense of anticipatory dread. But, of course, it wasn't one I recognized. Few of the governors I had served with would still be attached to the Twelfth after all this time. Finding myself coming abreast of the Vestroyan Revenant chasing Jonah, I took an opportunistic swipe at its neck with my chain blade, decapitating the thing neatly. It collapsed where it stood, only a trickle of foul-smelling fluid seeping from the wound in marked contrast to the geyser of blood which usually accompanied the severing of a head. The governor stared at me wide-eyed, although he didn't seem to be hyperventilating this time, which was probably just as well considering the reek of the twice-killed corpse. "'Are you all right?' I asked, because I was supposed to, and the servo skulls were still flitting about the place, picking the scene. "'Think so,' Jonah said, holding a handkerchief to a slight scratch on his cheek. "'Wouldn't have been in another minute.' He stepped fastidiously over the body. Thank you. His words were almost drowned out by the crackle of gunfire, which echoed around the cathedral. Now that their lines of fire were no longer blocked by panicking civilians, the rest of the Imperial Guard officers had begun picking off the remaining revenants. And not before time, if you ask me. What just happened? Castine asked, joining us. 
her eyes still flickering in every direction in search of a target. I haven't a clue, I told her honestly, hustling Jonah ahead of us, toward the welcoming arch of sunlight beyond the ornately carved door. But we need to find out fast. Something was very wrong on Latonia, and if past experience was anything to go by, it was going to get a whole lot worse. Editorial note. Although not strictly necessary, I've decided to include another extract from Warden's account at this point. Kane provides enough information to make the events of the intervening period before he picks up his own narrative again perfectly clear, but since the additional material is available, it seems sensible to use it. I have rather less confidence in the wisdom of inflicting the second extract on my readers, but it does at least elucidate the military position in which the 597th was unceremoniously pitched and those without the patience to wade through it are perfectly at liberty to skip the entire passage. Positively encouraged to, in fact. From The Liberation of Lintonia by Jonas Warden, Uncompleted Manuscript After the incident in the cathedral made the true nature of the crisis we were facing all too horrifically apparent, no effort was spared to trace the source of the outbreak and make sure it was properly contained. Having had the role of governor thrust unwillingly onto me, I was far out of my depth, but I was determined to do whatever was necessary to preserve Lintonia from any further harm. Though the job seemed incredibly daunting, I had the good advice of the Martial Law Council to rely on. Not to mention the reassuring presence of Commissar Kane, who had faced and overcome many perils before. His experience, I was sure, would stand us in good stead in the dark days to come. Ultimately, however, the decisions were mine alone to make, and I was determined to face and fulfill my responsibilities. Note, not entirely true, as the world was still technically under martial law, and he could have been overruled at any time. But the population were more likely to listen to edicts issued in the governor's name, and the Imperial Guard more than had its hands full. From, like a phoenix on the wing, the early campaigns and glorious victories of the Valhallen 597th, by General Jenet Sulla, retired. 101.M42 Ever the woman of action, Colonel Castine lost no time in apprising the senior officers of the regiment of the full implications of the grisly discovery made by her and Commissar Kane. Not a woman or man among us could have entirely suppressed a thrill of primal horror at the revelation that our true foes were not the misguided insurrectionists we'd been called here to force back to acceptance of the Emperor's light. But the very dead themselves, ripped untimely from their graves by the foulest of warp spawned sorceries, with so many of our gallant comrades in arms fallen victim to the contagion which had swept through their ranks, it fell to us, the only regiment thus far unscathed, to bear the brunt of this new and terrifying threat. Thus it was, that the daughters and sons of Valhalla took to the streets of Viasilix, determined to guard it, and the rule of the Golden Throne at all costs, including our own lives if necessary, the price which, ere long, it seemed we might all be called upon to pay. To be continued. All right, thank you everybody for listening to this uh, Caiaphas Kane, basically novella. This is part one. I think I'm going to manage it in three parts, maybe four, depending on how lazy I feel. But uh, thank you very much for for hanging out. I think the volume should be better on this. I'm making this note before I go back and listen to it. I think I got the volume fixed, um, or at least I think I've got it as good as it's going to get. Sorry. So, yeah, uh, I hope you enjoyed this one. Um. We're, this is the final collection of uh, Caiaphas Kane short stories, or, you know, this is the final omnibus, I should say, that's in publication at this date. So if you have ideas for other stories you'd like me to, to hear me do, um, I'm, I think I'm going to try and move a little away from, or, you know, diversify beyond just Warhammer 40k, but I'm more than open to, to comments, suggestions, constructive criticism. So I'll be doing these three uh, for for this short story and then I'll uh, I'll also do a, a compiled version where I put them all together so yeah uh, thanks and thanks once again for all the the kind supportive comments I really appreciate them
Y'all take care. Bye.